Yeah. Second hymn, mm -hmm. for, fourth um, verse. Okay, we've got uh, K T A M E. Kshetra Dapashyam. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Okay, I, that's twelve. That's why I'm in. Okay, hang on. Okay, wrong page. Five two four. Yeah. Yeah, I was on five twelve. That's the uh, so. Okay, there we go. Yuck. Yes, I have it now. So mm -hmm. this is good. Okay, so we stopped here. Let us start with mantra. <clears throat> Om Vang me manasi pratishtheta Mano me vachi pratishthetam Aviravir mahedhi Vedasyama anistha Shrutam me ma prahasihi Anena dhitena Oratran Samdadhami Ritam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanma Mavatu Tadvakta Ramavatu Avatu Mam Avatu Vaktaram Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 Anyam. So we stopped. Hi, Julia. Um, we stopped at this line, number four. We finished first three verses of the second hymn to of the Angira Sarishi's Atri family. So here it is. He repeats the previous phrase. Let us look into the previous where it was said, Kshetrat, Arat Kshetra Dapashyam, Ayudha Vimimanam, Hiranyadantam Shuchivarnam, Arat Kshetra Dapashyam, Ayudha Mimanam, Dadano Asma Amritam Viprikvat, Kimaman Indrach. Karinavan Anuktach. I saw him yeah, from far away field uh, preparing the weapons. It's as if in the dream you saw you saw him being busy making, shaping the weapons for conquest. And uh, to him I give to him the immortality in me. In all my separate parts, I surrender to him. And what shall they do to me who have not the word and the God mind is not in them? Well, we dwelt on it quite a bit. It's a profound yeah. statement of the Rishi. He already sees the difference between him and who gave his immortality to the divine will and those f forces which do not have that part in them. And the next repeats the same idea. Kshetra Dapashyam, he continues, I saw from the field Sanutash Charantam moving constantly Sumad Yutamna, as if the herd, a happy herd or perfect herd, Purusho Bhamanam, shining wide and everywhere. Nata Agaribharan, Ajanisht Hahishach, and uh, none could uh, capture them could seize onto them, for he is born. The is that oh, yes. Uh, so those cannot be captured, those luminous uh, herds of the 
uh, which are moving as if with him or he moves as if them. They cannot be captured, the his luminous uh, flames, for he is born. Palikni eat yuvatayo bhavanti. And uh, they that were old among them grow young once more. Mm -hmm. So Agni confers immortality. Right. I saw him moving from the place he dwells in, even as with a herd brilliantly shining, these seized him not. He had been born already. They who were gray with age again grew or grow youthful. Um, Quite a, quite a statement, yeah? We didn't see such statements before. Um, so again, from the far field, I saw him constantly moving. Sanutach uh, charantam. Sumadyutthamna, as if a happy herd a perfect herd, Purusho Bhamanam, shining wide. Or could be Sumat Na, could be together, with, as if with together with the verb, uh, with the herd, shining wide. Nata Agaribran, they do not seize him. Who are they? None. Shubhendu puts none or they don't seize him. They, we do not know who are they. According to uh, Griffiths, it is these herds, but I don't think so. May I ask a question? Mm. So, this, when, saw, is that, um, is that um, imperfect? Was that the imperfect tense? Or is it just implied there? Saha, you mean? Well, he said, I saw in the field. So what the Apache, question... Im, yeah, imperfect, I saw, yes. Imperfect. So the question then is, if seeing in the field in the past is, is um, just seeing it is not the same as embodying it or living it, um, is it is it in i mean is it enough to um to just because none of us is fully awakened to um that agni value um but we all know that it's there and we do see it from afar and we and we you know we recognize that in ourselves to a greater or lesser degree in you know, in everything that we endeavor these days, and is that enough for him to be born? Is that enough to have um, that to confer that that luminous quality to us? Just the fact that we know that it's there, and and we kind of have some sort of relationship to it, um, but it's not a dwelling. It's not dwelling within us in a continuous, perfect, non, um, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm asking. Well, um, yeah, I was, when you were asking, I just saw how we again saw <laughs> uh, that uh, we, uh, seeing is a direct evidence of the truth, yeah? Um, it's drishti, a revelation. Mm. When we are mental beings in the mental structure, seeing becomes something else altogether. It's never enough. And from this point of view, you are right. From the point of view of mental structure, seeing is not enough. It's only apprehending. It's not really comprehending and not even embodying. Um, but from the point of view of uh, this spiritual seeing, intuitive mind, yeah, that seeing is totally different. It's not the seeing of the mental 
structure of apprehensive consciousness. Uh, it is uh, direct evidence. It's the contact with the truth. Mm, it is that direct touch, direct being. You know, that seeing is something else. Uh, it is uh, the, the experience of the highest kind we can have. There is no higher experience than seeing we can have in the spiritual realm. Even sh Shruti hearing, understanding, is not as high as seeing, because seeing is a direct evidence of the truth. Light. We, yeah, we are in contact with that being. We are that being in that moment. Well, so is that what the Rishi is referencing here then? Is that that, ex that thing and not say what we're doing now, which is investigating and, and unearthing and trying to have some, some knowledge, some contact on the level of the Veda. Yeah, for us, um, seeing for the mental being, I mean, for the, for the people of mental consciousness, seeing is nearly conceptual so to say, seeing how things are. But for a Rishi, seeing is something else. And that's why he uses not Kshetre in the Kshetra, but Kshetrat from the Kshetra. Yeah? He sees him from the Kshetra, maybe even because of some field or, or from the field he sees him. It's very interesting that he uses from it twice. From far that, away, from far away domain, from the domain he sees him. Not, um, he doesn't see him uh, in his mind or something. He doesn't see him in in his imagination. He sees him from his own domain. Yeah? He he touched upon he he discovered the domain in which the agony is. He saw him there preparing the weapon first. Yeah busy with the weapon. Yeah, I even can imagine in my mind that he saw him busy even not noticing the Rishi seeing him, you know. And he saw him like, you know, doing something there. And he, uh, and for him it was a, a shock that he discovered the being mm, who is preparing the conquest and, and the battle for, with the forces of darkness. I do not know. It, it is very vivid, uh, much more vivid than conceptual and uh, apprehensive um, uh, analysis and thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it belongs to this realm of experience and seeing here is the highest. Shubindu speaks about this, that Drishti Drishti is the highest, it's the revelation. Revelation doesn't mean that it is revealing itself to us and then it is not there. It means that everything is being revealed around it, yeah? Revealed in its uh, true uh, divine value. It's a direct presence of the being, not even consciousness, but of the being. Um, but then why would they call these texts Shruti instead of Drishti? <laughs> well, both, both Shruti and Drishti, these are two powers, and also Viveka, three powers of the Rishis, Drishti, Shruti, and Viveka. There are also three rivers, as we learned already, and there is Ila, uh, Saraswati, and Mahi. This belongs to these three powers of revelation, of inspirational knowledge or shruti or understanding and um, uh, bharati or mahi who is vastness which embodies both are you in norway again are you still in Spain? yes i'm in norway yeah back to four degrees today we had a nice day it was nearly 10 there was sunny oh, day okay. oh 10 10 11 is lovely Beautiful. Yeah. So, yes, uh, would you yeah? You know, would you repeat it? The the three are Shruti, Drishti, and Viveka. Drishti, Shruti, and Viveka. Viveka is. Say that again. Viveka. 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 Viveka, Viveka. Nanda. 
Vivekananda. Uh, yeah. Viveka means discrimination. Discernment. Mm -hmm. Discernment, yes. Uh, discernment of intuition. We are seeing what is what, where it is, and why it is where it is. But uh, revelation is the contact, direct. Uh, Shruti is the indirect, so to say, direct inspiration by understanding of what it is, uh, how things relate to this, what we see. And, uh, and finally, the Viveka, we discern the body of this. We distinguish it as different from others, what it is, as it is. So are those, they are not, are those three Mahabhutas? I mean, are they, uh, is it like, is it like Tejas and, and Vayu and, and Buddhi? They are like uh, three realms or three powers of the supermind. And this is uh, Satyam, Ritam, Brihat. Oh. Truth, dynamic truth and vastness. So that satyam, that direct touch with what is, is this seeing. Yeah? It's not, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the drishti of the mind. So satyam is drishti and... and um, Ritam is shruti. Ritam is shruti and viveka is... Brihat. Brihat. That's good to know. Well, we are identifying them on, in our mind, yes. uh, of course, uh, but uh, uh, in themselves, these three rivers are constantly m mentioned in the Rig Veda, yeah? and they are named. There are other four rivers behind, which are never named, but mentioned as seven rivers. So out of these seven, these are three rivers. So I guess I was just trying to connect to this verse and what, um, you know, what, <coughs> at what point, or if there's a way of seeing from this verse when he was born, at, you know, at which stage um, he's actually considered born, whether it's just... Um, being able, I mean, when he was born means that it, it's a living, it's, it's a living drishti. It's, it's alive. It's full of, um, it, it's alive in us. And, and, and we are that. Um, yeah. It's not, just, it's, it's not just a notion. It's, no. it's a living thing. But if you read how Sri Aurobindo beautifully translates, I saw in the field as though a happy herd that ranged continuously in many forms of luminous beauty, none could seize on them, for he was born. Now, he is the bull of the herds, yeah? They are the herds. So none could attack these herds because there is a master there, a bull. So they can, you know, spread their luminosity all over nature. And this is the this conquest of the light which he brings in yeah, with the herds. Even though they were old among them, grow young once more. And all those who could not already sustain that movement without him when grew old, now they changed and became young again and can move again as if nothing happened. That light of the spirituality was reborn within us. Mm -hmm. That light which was already decaying and uh, you know falling into the darkness and uh, oblivion now again are taken out and refreshed, made new. Can I, I, I wanted to make a com comment. Um, uh, one of, of course, translating is so challenging, but the word, the verb at the end, bhavanti, is actually present tense. Correct. And which, of course, which, of course, in Sanskrit has a 
far more comprehensive meaning than it does in English. And so it's as if this, this is outside of time. It's not just happened in the past. It's, con it's like yeah. going on all the time. Am I, am I correct in saying correct, that? Correct, correct, absolutely. So no, the, but Tayo is the thing that is growing. Yeah. In, uh, you know, they are young. You, yuvati is young, yuvatayach, young bhavanti become. They become young again. But becoming, as, as Lynn was saying, that that's like a perpetual becoming. Correct. They are becoming again young. Yeah, it's quite interesting the usage of the tenses. If you see apashyam, I saw already. It's not in the present, not I see, yeah? uh, but I saw, I I've kind of, uh, I discovered or I, I became aware of this uh, growth of happy herds whom none can uh, conquer because he, because they, he is born. He, he was born, Ajanishta. It's actually a orist, he was born. So he is already possessing these treasures. It looks like that he already liberated the herds from the cave of darkness. And uh, once they are liberated, there is no way to go back. So it's not a flash. It's not a. It's not an Indra moment. It's not a drishti that just you see it and then you know, then you go back to something else. It's it's a it's an actual transformation that happens in consciousness. That is, um, and that word. Um, where was the verb? Um, Ajanishta. Mm -hmm. It's it's an establishment. Yeah, he was born, yeah. Ajanishtha is the oldest from Jan to be born. He was born. There is no doubt about this. It's not being born or will be born. He was born because he was born. Nobody can seize upon them. Nobody seized them. Nobody seized them because he was born. This is the, like literal, and and those old indeed become young. Young. This young is actually spiritual. Old means lack of spirituality, spiritual energy. Um, so you that yuvati is um, is 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 an awake is an uh, illumination. It's an uh, it's a uh, yuvati young, yeah, young because it's full of uh, energy. Which we, actually spiritual is immortal and cannot be old. Yeah, that cannot happen. Uh, can be ancient but not old. There is, well, I mean, there's the the Aurobindos and the Maharshis, and they, I mean, they they left this world in the body. I mean, they left their body. So, I mean, even the great the great 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 seers, even you know Agastya Rishi and all these old, they are gone, <laughs> or or their bodies are gone. Now, I meant uh, to speak about the the gods, gods and uh, those energies which are within us. Yeah? Body is not yet conquered in that way, yes. And that's why it gets old. Everything which is not conquered by light is getting old and dies. Um, but uh, everything else which is spiritual, purely spiritual, yes, and conquered by the spirit will be re refreshed or rejuvenated by this force. That's what mm. it is being said here. It can't be otherwise. So that's what Sri Aurobindo was fighting for. He wanted to have a body 
which would be um, immortal, which would sustain itself in time. But he couldn't make it. Yeah? There were other conditions which are coming, which were not allowing this to happen. But it doesn't mean that it should not be attempted or wanted or, you know, sought after. Well, that, that's what uh, Vedic Rishis are looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think. It's quite obvious here. So once these herds of light move of vastly shining and nobody grabbed them or, or nobody could uh, control them, seize upon them, because he was born, the divine will was born within them, so they are free finally from that confinement in the darkness, in the subconscious cave. They broke the cave and now they are free. The herds of the sun move towards new dawn and new sun. So that is the moment when they Purusha Bhamana, this uh, herd is shining wide and nobody seized upon them because he was born. And those who were old among them, who didn't have his support for a long time because they were confined to this, um, captured in this uh, subconscious cave for too long. So they got, they grew old. They, they, the darkness started to influence that light and corrode it. Yeah? And they became young again and free again, or well, they become young and free again, again, again. So not just became once, they are becoming always young, perpetually becoming young, within this darkness which is trying to capture it and to make it old. Yeah. Well, it's quite possible that we will come to that point where this will be possible. Maybe, maybe. yeah, maybe not in this lifetime, yeah, not in this lifetime. but e eventually, eventually we may remember those moments that we were sitting, I in Norway, you in the US, and um, we were discussing this great vision of the Rishi, um, of the change of our nature. Once consciousness is dwelling within this being and can regenerate its energies, uh, which is totally re reborn every time into the new. Uh, they speak even about the dawn in the same way. Yuvati Purani, she is ancient and young always. Why young always? Because that energy is constantly always new. Navo, Navo Bhavati. Yeah, it's in this in this time and space it is really new all the time. Um, because in time and space it feels like it, if we think that the spirituality which we had experienced before, spiritual presence, is the same as we experienced it before, then I must say it must be not it. It must be a shadow, an image of it uh, in the mind. But if we uh, experience it always as fresh and new, then it must be it. It's always young, always a newborn. It has that sense of it, uh, this feeling of this being yuvatayah bhavanti. They are constantly young, perpetually young. Well, mm. I guess that's why I was asking about is because I think we all see it in the mind. You know, we all we we know that it's there, and we see it in the mind, and occasionally we have a glimpse or a moment where. Mm -hmm. the whole thing, the, 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 the veil parts and we see the extent of the whole vision, the Vedic vision, the whole thing, and then it closes again. But once you see it once, once you have that vision, even just for a, a, a moment, 
it's it's born it's there we know that it's there mm -hmm. but it's not the same thing as being established in it and having mm -hmm. it you know mm -hmm. so that's where I, that's what i was asking about the the so seeing in the field you know and mm -hmm. in the perfect tense you know mm -hmm. just i saw it and then it, 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 as if i saw it and now i don't see it right or correct. i saw it and and that vision you know and that's i think something that we've all had i'm sure we've all had or else we wouldn't be able to sit here and keep studying this mm. yeah but it's in the mind it's but once it's gone or once that vision is no longer it, it it's a it's a memory you know mm. it's a memory of it and if that's if the memory is enough for uh, it to be born and to have uh, that growing young, <laughs> you know, or, or regeneration in that right. sense. Yeah, the, the, the spiritual perception is always fresh, yeah? And um, we have to agree uh, to really undo all our, every time we have to undo our experiences in a way so to say uh, we have to agree to know nothing again yeah? we have to start from the empty um, uh, stage as it were we have to clean up again and again with the wonder and the sincerity aspire for this knowledge admitting that we know very little or nearly nothing and um, this uh, clears up the field. Yeah? This is Barhis. We are inviting the gods into the empty, uh, cleaned up uh, space within our consciousness. And then we can have the real perception again. Because the shadow in the mind, the even luminous shadow yeah, of the experience we had before, can uh, build up religions, cults, and so on. We will be worshipping these forces, we will be mm, doing many rituals, but the experience will be gone. And there will, we will be dealing only with the shadow of experience. That's what re really religions do, yeah? They don't have much of experience. They are already overloaded with their own past experiences. And that becomes very mm, difficult. In this case, uh, what I wanted to say, what came to my mind when I, you were talking, I thought of uh, why a cartole, for example, has such a big audience. And I will tell you why. Why a who? A cartole, for example. Oh, a cartole, yes. For one simple reason. What he does, he clears up the field. Nothing else. Once he, the field is cleared, he says there is only this moment of now. Now, this moment of now clears up the field. Yeah? And uh, then you, you, you will have to perceive it again, new, fresh. You cannot perceive it uh, through what you know. No, that will not do. Yeah? Mm. You will have to open up. You will have to, to listen. You have to aspire for it. And that's what he does. And that's why he is so successful. So who, who again? Uh, why a what? Eckhart such Tolle. An audience? Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle. Oh. Or you haven't okay, heard? I guess I'm just missing. I haven't. I did just, so spell it. Okay. Eckhart uh, a C K I I think it is A It's E. E. A e Oh it's E E C yeah. Can you spell it? E C K A R T Eckhart. E-O-L-L-E. Okay. Okay. Now I, I recognize the name there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle, or for that matter, Krishna Murti, for example, he he did the same. He was clearing up the field, and nothing else is done. Just uh, saying that we have to start from where we are, who we are, and not to make much of what we know. And from there, there is some happening. May happen. May happen. Mm -hmm. 
very little, but it is authentic. It is true into that moment of time. Well, I was just thinking that this is one of the things, this is where the battlefield is exactly between um, the ahankar, which holds on absolutely desperately to everything that, that all the experiences and the thoughts and the emotions and everything that have been accumulated mm -hmm. because it's desperate to hold on to this, to that identity of mm -hmm. that small self. That's the battle. That's, this is the Kshetra, mm -hmm. uh, Kurukshetra mm -hmm. is between that um, holding on to those experiences and, and then the impulse that Agni, um, brings to bear on uh, on the ev the force of evolution to clear the field and 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 empty the whole thing out and and i mean if you've ever been on the verge of of that moment where everything just completely clears out and you're just there's there you're there poised on the on the edge of absolute annihilation and absolute you know being born like this mm -hmm. it's um it's it is it's a it's a it's a moment of of uh complete terror and complete um uh you know bliss mm -hmm. and most of the time most of the time i think in, unless you have that graceful moment the ahankar pulls you back into Absolutely. identification. Very with, nice. I have um, the same experience. So very nice uh, what you're saying. It's exactly that. It pulls you back. It wants something smaller, which you already know where you are already. Yeah, very, very nice. A kind of safety, a kind of uh, knowing, feeling that you really know something when at that moment there's nothing to know and you don't know anything anyway. <laughs> and it convinces you to take little from this experience rather than to take everything. So it wants to accumulate bit by bit and change. It wants to be, to grow together with this change. It doesn't want to leave. It is scared to leave. Because in the moment of that uh, global experience, it will disappear. So it doesn't want to disappear. It, right. it wants to stay uh, changed, spiritualized, whatever, you name it. I will do everything. But let us keep up with what we already achieved. Let us pile up our achievements. Yeah? And, yeah, and then tell everybody about it. Yes, and then, uh, then create classes online. <laughs> And make out of it some some sense, you know, some living. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> what's the sense of it? Yeah? This is ego. You're absolutely right. And somehow, this argument is so convincing to the whole system, to the whole body, physical, vital, and mental, that they kind of eighty percent agree immediately, silently agree with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, but somehow the rishis have figured it out or, or, or transcended the whole process. And they write, you know, they were kind enough and compassionate enough to um, express these things, these realizations, so that at least there's some sort of a, a roadmap to um, that kind of freedom. Mm. Now, rishis are unique in this case because um, they are not evolutionary beings. They didn't go through that we are going through. Yeah, they they already brought this knowledge down and found the way to 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 express it for us through through the the, the swaras and just through right. the whole through our languages, which we may understand, and our inner being may understand and follow. Um, so they created this tool or vehicle for us 
which will help us grow in consciousness. And the, the beauty of it that they use this simple language, you know. It's very sophisticated in events, but very simplistic in, in forms and in, in, in images, which we may understand, all people. You don't have to be highly educated to understand this imagery. It will work the same way in the spiritual plane as it works in this physical plane here. Uh, so, but it has to be true to the event and true to the consciousness which perceives it. And then we feel that truth. Yes, this to be always new is the key, by the way. Key to everything. They speak about the word which is constantly new. And the word of straightness is the word of the truth, which is new, always new. And the word of crookedness is the word of old truth. So every old truth, when repeated, when becomes, when, when is, it is dogmatic already, religious, becomes an obstacle for the word of a new, that the new energy has to come. So it's a difficult task to express these um, these things in poetry. But I, I'm interested in the ever new thing because everything that is being expressed, I mean, we have this ancient knowledge, ancient tradition. Um, and I could see when it becomes um, entrenched that it, that it becomes dogmatic. But um, they couldn't make new, it. Yeah. But ever new, that also d quite disturbs me um, most of the time because you you see people feeling like they can c kind of upgrade the Veda or something, or they can up, you know, they can upgrade. They they can sing, you know, chant Sanskrit with a heart with a um, I don't know a computer uh, aided. Uh, um, music in the background and somehow it's it's a, that's upgraded and it's it's more new it's more present it's more relevant because it's got you know it's got um, components from what's popular and well that is not uh, new but just uh, it's new in the form it's like you put another cloth on it but the the real new has to be the content the the very thing has to be always fresh always um, always spiritual means fresh always new uh, if it is not new then then there is no even this weather what we are reading is always new and fresh it speaks about it all the time that it must be so. That's why nobody could really even make tradition out of it. Nobody did any traditionalistic understanding of it. It was taken in the, its form and put into rituals and that's it. There is no explanation, there is no deep look into it, there is no deep uh, uh, even understanding. It's totally lacking. Veda could not be really taken by dogma didn't happen. Ritualism was introduced, but ritualism doesn't come from the Veda. Vedas never speak about rituals. Atharva Veda does. Atharva Veda is a uh, is mi mixture of many different layers of knowledge. Some layers of variation. Yajur Veda talks about rituals. Yajur Veda is dedicated to it totally. Yajur Veda mixed up the Samhita text with Brahmana and made out of it uh, one ritualistic huge uh, component. But um, we are talking about these rishis who do not speak about rituals. Rig Veda, you mean? Yes. Samhita. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I wanted to add some comments uh, from the uh, perspective of the person born in the mid-20th century when it seemed as though uh, there was such a move to to refresh from the past. Uh, I think my parents who survived depression and World War II, well, uh, I guess I saw with my eyes the, that the, the fault of that was some shallowness, oh. uh, some uh, 
and that I, and how else am I explaining why I'm sitting here today looking at Rig Veda? Right. Yeah, you know, so so it's uh, that I think when we're saying this, it's a rhetorical, it's a rhetorical position uh, because uh, uh, to let go of your where you are stuck, come back, come back to the well, so to speak. But it's not the same thing as saying no tradition. That because if there were no tradition, we would not have this because nobody would have memorized it. Of course, of course. No, I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying that in the Rig Veda, they do not speak about rituals, but they speak about very interesting this last phrase those old grew new, grow new. And old when old grow new, become new, that may mean something. Yeah? That means there is a refreshment of spiritual component in them, and that refreshment changes them from old to new and this is the secret of the presence of the divine will in everything so everything which is old today even rituals even dogmas even religions even our mental views uh, and scientific views uh, can be refreshed and can reveal their divine element in them mm. Mm. If the divine will is there, born, everything becomes the divine because there is nothing here in this world which is not the divine. Right. So you see, we've made a round about it, quite a round, yeah? Mm -hmm. About well, all the. It was a very penetrating analysis. Nice, a very nice verse. And it's a very rich uh, hymn, by the way. Each verse is the whole vision of some kind. Okay, there will be next verse. Ke me mariakam viyavanta gobhi na yesham gopa aranashidasa ya im jagribhur avates rijantu Ajati Pashva Upanachikitvan. Who were they that divorced my strength from the herds of light? Mm, good question. Against them there was no protector, nor any worker in this war. Let those that look or took, sorry, took them from me release them to me again. For he, with his conscious perceptions, comes driving to us our lost herds of the radiances. Mm. Now, this is uh, something, yeah? There is a, so there is him, the bull, and the radiances, the herds, the herds are somehow separated from the divine will, the divine being, the divine soul, consciousness. And they are lost in some way. Uh, there was something which separated the, the sense of, uh, of uh, being, the sense of the divine self, from the uh, working in nature of the divine elements of the self, of his powers. So, who divorced my strength from the herds of light? Consciousness and strength. Who divorced the being and consciousness? Against them, there was no protector, nor any worker in this war. No. Let those who took from them from me release them to me again. So, this is the sacrifice. For he with his conscious perceptions comes driving to us our lost herds of radiances. Hmm. But who were they? <laughs> yeah. It's a question. They, For, were, they even had Russians back then. Yeah, they were, Russians were always there. These are elder brothers, as they call themselves. By the way, you know that they call themselves elder brothers of Ukrainians and others, other peoples? Mm -hmm. 
they are elder brothers <laughs> as <laughs> as uh, asuras call themselves to the gods <laughs> they also elder brothers <laughs> <laughs> they are elder brothers they are they were here first these forces of darkness who are they and against them there was no protector oh gads what an ugly what an ugly thought yeah the that was the whole manifestation which took place in the darkness darkness became the field into which all these forces of light descended no mm -hmm. Uh, so as it is said that Ratri is the one who introduces all the beings into manifestation yeah? she is the Jagatach Niveshani she is the one who is introducing all the forces into this world um, so he, she gives them the, the, the field the, uh, of dwelling it's a dwelling place so we do not know about them much, we do not see them, but it is there, that inconscient being, darkness, which comes from the first creation. This will be a great place to start next time. Yes, oh yeah, it's time, yeah, time to stop. Great, let us stop here and then start from here, because this is the major myth of the Veda of the darkness um, separating light um, of consciousness from its force. Um, okay, I will end with mantra. So are we back on Wednesdays? Yeah, I think so. Or if, if you don't like it, we can shift. Only I, I, Friday is now, yeah, I can't, I, yeah. This is better for me, is it? How about for you, Lynn? This is good, and I'm trying to achieve stability so that I can make other things happen that have to happen. So are we all. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, how are you? Uh, is it uh, good, everything? <laughs>